Hey guys, welcome back to Pop em Up Chem, and we are following Alice further down the rabbit hole into organic chemistry today, following another functional group. This time, we're going to be looking at the alcohols, and we're going to be looking at a couple of important reactions of the alcohols. So let's get on with it. So we'll be looking at why alcohols make such good fuels. We're going to describe esterification for SL, although we will be revisiting this later in the unit for HL. And lastly, we're going to be evaluating the products of oxidation reactions and how the structure of an alcohol can affect that. But first, there's a question to get started on differentiated for HL or SL students. So pick your poison and give it a go. So drawing out the mechanism first, we've got the alkene, propionine, and it's reacting with HBr. So we're going to have the HBr as our electrophile. So remember when we drawing the structure of HBr, we have the polar bond, which causes the delta positive on the hydrogen, delta negative on the bromine, which is where the electrons from the double bond attack, causing the heterolytic break of the bond, which gives us our carbocation intermediate. And remembering Markovnikov's rule for the hydrogen adding to the carbon with the most hydrogens already. And we've got Br- minus floating around, which is going to attack this carbocation and then attach itself just there, which gives us the 2-bromopropane product. For the SL, you would have just had to write this as an overall reaction of C3H6 plus HBr goes to C3H7Br. Now, when we're looking at alcohols, let's first deal with the most simple of these reactions, which is good old fashioned combustion. So on the surface, we're still producing the same things as when we combusted the alkenes or alkanes. We're still producing carbon dioxide and water. However, because of the higher proportion of oxygen, as in there's oxygen present in the molecule, these are very readily combustible. So we need less oxygen to combust them compared to uh, alkanes. However, because they are already partially oxidized, they do contain less energy per gram than the analogous alkane. So these are used as fuel additives. Uh, some cars can run pure alcohols and some countries like Brazil have huge proportions of alcohols in their fuels because they produce a lot of ethanol domestically from sugarcane production. Methanol specifically has also been used for a long time in motorsports and still is specifically used in top fuel drag racing because even though it's less energy dense than petrol because it requires less oxygen to burn the same volume of fuel higher volumes of fuel can be burnt in the engine at once, allowing more power output. However, alcohols also undergo quite a few other interesting reactions, one of which is the esterification of alcohols. If we mix a carboxylic acid with an alcohol and we set that up, we heat it and set it up usually with sulfuric acid catalyst, we form the corresponding ester and esters are used as food additives as well as well as, as well as many other things so they're an important industrial industry so they're an important industrial feedstock now the reaction is usually done with sulfuric acid because it is an equilibrium so we have the catalyst but h2so4 also acts as dehydrating agent which removes H2O from solution, which helps shift the equilibrium towards the right hand side. We will be revisiting esterification in more detail later on in the unit for HL. And this is the extent of what the SL students need to know. Now, combustion is not the only oxidation reaction we can do with alcohols. Indeed, the oxidations of alcohols that are not complete or incomplete combustion are very important. The good thing is here, neither SL or HL students need mechanisms for these. We just need the reaction scheme, which we're going to look at. Instead, we use oxidizing agents 
to induce changes in the alcohol molecules. Common ones include potassium dichromate, which goes from an orange color and then turns to a green color as the oxidation state goes from six to three, and potassium permanganate, which goes from a kind of deep purple color when it is an oxidation state of plus seven down to an either colorless or very, very pale pink color when it is in oxidation state plus two. So the key to understanding the oxidation reaction scheme for alcohols is understanding the difference in reactivity between primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols. Let's first consider a primary alcohol. So here we've got propanol, which is primary. Now we can oxidize this. Now usually when we write this symbol O with square brackets around it, that symbolizes any oxidizing agent. So that could be dichromate or permanganate. And we can do this with distillation or reflux. And we get different products for both of those. So if we go through the process of distillation, then we get the corresponding aldehyde, which in this case is going to be propanol. And we can easily visualize this oxidation as the removal of hydrogens. You can see that the hydrogen on the oxygen and the hydrogen on the carbon have been removed from the alcohol to the aldehyde. Now, if we reflux this reaction, then we end up with a further oxidation towards a carboxylic acid. And here we can see the carboxylic acid has an extra oxygen. So we can visualize the oxidation as a gain of oxygen. Glad you paid attention in the redox unit. Now, if these concepts of distillation and reflux are new to you, let's just have a quick overview of what they are. A distillation, we have a Liebig condenser attached almost perpendicular to a round bottom flask containing our alcohol. Heating it will cause it to evaporate and travel up the tube and then to the right down the Liebig condenser, which has water circulating around it, which cools the vapor, causing it to condense and then drip out the bottom, giving us the product. It's usually capped at the top with a thermometer coming through so we can monitor the heat and control that. So that's distillation. Now, reflux is similar. We start with a round bottom flask, but instead we put the Liebig condenser vertically in cap the top with a thermometer. And so now as the alcohol is heated at the bottom, the vapor travels up the Liebig condenser, but as it gets up through and cools, it condenses on the side and then slowly drops back down into the original solution. And we can continue this for a long period of time, allowing the reaction to happen over and over again. This allows for the further oxidation. Okay, let's make some space and have a look at a secondary alcohol then. In this situation, we form the corresponding ketone. And we can see, again, we're removing a hydrogen from the carbon the alcohol group is attached to and from the oxygen in the alcohol group. However, unlike the aldehyde formed with the primary, we no longer have that free hydrogen to be further oxidized. So we cannot have a second step. No matter how long we reflux it, we're only ever going to get this ketone. So what would we expect for tertiary? Well, if we draw out a tertiary alcohol, what we see is the carbon that the alcohol group is attached to doesn't have any free hydrogens to lose. And so this cannot be further oxidized at all. So with tertiary, we get none, no matter how much reflux or distillation we do. So we see a trend as we go from most to least reactive. Primary, we get aldehydes if we distill them. If we reflux them, we get carboxylic acids. Secondary, if we reflux or distill them, depending on the structure and the nature of the initial alcohol, we get ketones. And doesn't matter what we do, we get no reaction with tertiary alcohols. And we don't need mechanisms for these either, you'll be pleased to know. So how can we apply this to 
determining what products we're going to get. Well, it really is as simple as thinking about primary, secondary, and tertiary. Let's have a look at this question. Give the products of the oxidation of butan-2-ol with potassium dichromate. So when we draw out butan-2-ol, what do we find? Well, we find that because the alcohol group is on the second carbon, that we have a secondary alcohol. If we have a secondary alcohol, then we're going to form the corresponding ketone. We've got those hydrogens to lose, but we can't go all the way to a carboxylic acid. So we're going to form the carbon chain on either side of the C double bond O, giving us the ketone. Okay, time to test yourself out on it then. What would the product be when butan-2-ol is oxidized with potassium permanganate? Pause it here to have a go. Pop them up! Well, we can see in this question, if we draw out butan-2-ol, then we know that we have a secondary alcohol. So if we have a secondary alcohol, we can't fully oxidize this. We can't go to a carboxylic acid. We're just going to be removing the hydrogens on the carbon and on the oxygen. So we're going to go through to a ketone by removing these hydrogens, giving our C double bond O on that second carbon and our carbon chains either side. Lovely stuff. Brilliant guys. So you have the benefit here of not needing to know the mechanisms, but you do need to know the full scheme and how the different alcohols react with oxidizing agents. There will be an oxidization of alcohols video along with to go along with the questions from the workbook. But for now, just have a look at the questions on the alcohols. Thanks for joining me, guys. Please remember, like, subscribe, share the videos, and as always, practice makes slightly better.